Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nia. I'm one of the producers of Tomofest, and we're really excited to have you here for this session. This is AI and the fight against climate change. And we'll be moderate, your moderator today will be Sasha Lucioni. Sasha is a postdoctoral researcher at the Mila Institute, where she works with Yashua Bengio, among others, to visualize the consequences of climate change with AI. And we have several wonderful guests here. You'll hear from Claire Montalioni, Kalai Ramea, and Sharon Zhou. Uh, and Nana Ama Brown Kutz may be joining us later in the session. You'll hear more about them. And before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors for their support of Twimmelfest and today's session. And a quick note, since today's session is hosted on Zoom, please take a minute to note where the chat is. You can send any of your questions there. We'll be monitoring and relaying the questions into the panel. So feel free to send anything you like. Um, and also if you're watching on YouTube, we will be looking at the YouTube chat as well. Um, so that's all I got. I'm gonna turn it over to Sasha. Thanks, Mia. Um, come on over, your panelists. Um, so I'll present you uh, briefly. Uh, Claire Montiglioni is an associate professor and the associate chair for inclusive excellence in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her research on machine learning for the study of climate change helped launch the inter interdisciplinary field of climate informatics. Welcome, Claire. Um, Kalai Ramea, uh, she's a data scientist at the Palo Alto Research Center, and her interests broadly lie in machine learning, statistics, and quantitative modeling. Um, now, Sharon Jo, she is a PhD candidate at Stanford University in computer science, advised by Andrew Eng, and her work in AI spans from the theoretical to the applied in medicine, climate, and more broadly, social good. Welcome, everyone. I'm honestly, on a personal level, I'm so happy to be here. I'm a huge fan of all of your work. So for me, this is like a dream come true. Um, so I wanted to start with like an icebreaker question just to kind of set the stage. Um, so can each of you mention how you got invol involved in the field of machine learning and climate change and whether it was like an aha moment uh, when you're you know, riding your bike somewhere or was it like a gradual transition? Um, Claire, if you want to start. Sure. Um, so I grew up in New York City. Um, I won't really say exactly the decade, but um, there was a lot of activism around um, climate change that I was involved in, in a, as a high schooler. I organized an environmental awareness day in high school and we got Mayor David Dinkins to come. Okay, so that gives you the era. Um, and we served lunch on Frisbees. Um, so I knew I wanted to um, make a difference in an environmental field. I thought I would actually be an environmental lawyer and focus on environmental justice. And that's actually coming full circle. But um, in, in college, it seemed that I would need to know about computer science to understand the climate models. And computer science is really fun and fascinated, fascinating. So um, I got sidetracked um, for many years just being a machine learning researcher and actually on the very theoretical and algorithmic end. Um, and then when I was looking um, for uh, job positions, I was advised by a mentor that it's also good to have an application area. And I think he was talking about text or images or things that are studied in industry. And I really was passionate about climate change and figured um, there had to be a way to use um, machine learning in that sphere. So I just started writing about it really aspirationally in my research statements to apply for jobs. Um, and luckily a sort of a visionary AI researcher at Columbia bought into this vision, hired me. He said we could hire a whole group on the topic and we could start an event um, on it. And then I finally met my first climate scientist and started collaborating in 2008. Thank you. Uh, Kalai, do you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, so my background is a bit different from all of you. I think I have a civil engineering background. So I studied a lot about environmental engineering, management and transportation in my undergrad and grad school. Uh, and I went to work as a sustainable transportation researcher uh, before I got into PhD. So while I was doing that, I realized there are broader climate questions to be answered. Uh, so that pushed me into my PhD program, which was mostly interdisciplinary, like developing energy systems models for transportation, residential and other areas. And my specific focus was studying human behavior and including in long-term energy systems models. 
um, we worked for the state of California and uh, uh, I also worked with the, uh, as a research fellow at IASA Austria to study uh, the North American model and the global model, which went into part of the IPCC reports, which is uh, Intergovernmental Planet, uh, Panel on Climate Change. Um, working with all these people, like from different parts of it, it pretty much like set my um, ambition and career that this is what I should be working on. And also like we're all seeing the effects of climate change all around us, you know, through wildfires, hurricanes and whatnot. Um, so th there is no dampening of my fashion. So it's only increasing more and more as it goes on. And when I joined PARC, uh, that was a, a nice amalgamation of my domain science uh, and I worked on quantitative modeling so far. So it was a, a little bit of leap from there to machine learning. And uh, um, we have been working on different kinds of problems to address that. So uh, it has been a bit of a learning curve to uh, enter into the machine learning world from like typical statistical quantitative modeling, but uh, it has only expanded my uh, expertise as well as view on and, and all the other challenges that could be tackled with what the skills that we have. Um, so yeah, pretty much uh, it, is, it has been a long scenic journey, but uh, throughout all the way I've picked up uh, lessons here and there. And uh, I, I think the interdisciplinary background comes in handy when you're talking about all kinds of climate change issues. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's uh, it's really important to have different backgrounds as part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, do you want to give a bit of background on yourself? Yes. Uh, so uh, it was a few years ago, I was working on AI for social good more broadly and specifically within uh, healthcare um, and looking into how potentially AI could be helpful. And it was really important to have um, this cross collaboration and to meet each other halfway, right? To meet each other halfway, both as AI person towards uh, a doctor and a doctor towards the AI side. And that's when my advisor actually um, talked to your advisor, Sasha. And, uh, and I remember when he told me, Andrew told me, uh, hey, I just got off the phone with Yashua or I chatted with Yashua uh, and we were talking about climate change and we think that we can potentially maybe be useful in this space or at least try to galvanize a wave of um, AI scientists to go into this space because all we're working on in general are like pushing benchmarks on things and maybe even working on surveillance that it's like questionable, right? So if we can even get a few people you know, into this space a little bit more, that that could mean a lot. And I thought, yes, I've always cared about climate change. I never thought I could apply uh, my skills in AI to it. And so I was very willing to explore. And I remember going into AI and he healthcare and medicine. I didn't know anything about medicine. And now I can, you know, I can't say I can diagnose cancer, but I can kind of like see cancerous bacteria in um, uh, histopathological slides. And so I think like, meeting halfway is important. And I was, I was like, I was hoping that I could apply that skill again and again, and um, hopefully make a small, a small tiny dent in the space um, and also encourage others to get into it as well. Yeah, I think that's all we're, we're all uh, going towards is, is, to, is to make an impact. I, I think that it's, it's, it's definitely a big problem and this is why it's so important to be multidisciplinary, right? Because there's so many aspects to climate change and often people are overwhelmed by it because there's so much to it um, and so many things that we have to do in order to move the needle. But uh, I, I like that each one of us are kind, is kind of bringing different things to the table and, and working from different aspects. Um, and actually uh, building on that, so what do you think are, are like the, the biggest challenge that we're facing as a community of, you know, computer scientists, more broadly speaking, um, involved in fighting climate change. So are there you know, battles that have already been won, others that are still ongoing? Do you, do you feel that you're, we're really going towards, uh, we're making progress on the issue? Um, Claire, do you wanna start? Um, maybe a battle, you're saying battle within CS is um, you know, attracting early career people into this field. So, um, Arinda Banerjee and I, um, you know, tried to excite young machine learners and all machine learners to work on this back at NeurIPS 2014. And afterwards, some of the media attention were, you know, like Silicon Valley reporters who showed up at the conference. Um, 
And I remember this reporter kept saying, well, what is the killer app? Meaning what, what can working on climate change, um, like how can that make somebody a lot of money? And it was really hard to just ch change the conversation because I was saying, well, you know, you can have the best idea in the world and be running a startup, but if you wake up in the morning and you can't breathe the air or it's too hot, um, you know, that, that's not gonna work anyway. And um, we're in a field um, where careers are highly compensated. Um, one thing that's awesome though, is that you're seeing companies stepping up and starting initiatives in this space. So Microsoft AI for Earth, uh, Google has a team on AI for Weather. Um, so that's, that's starting to come around, but I still think um, that's an issue. And then also when you mentor students and they go out into the world, um, you know, what are their career possibilities with this interdisciplinary background? Yeah, I would uh, add to what Claire said. I think uh, climate informatics was one of the first venues that actually brought in uh, the domain experts with uh, some sort of you know machine learning and deep learning. It, I mean, it started in uh, a decade ago, even before all this was a conversation, right? So when I attended that uh, a few years ago, like I was just blown away by uh, the content. And I think even during then, uh, there was a constant chat about like, how can we keep this enthusiasm going, right? Um, I think we have come a far, far away from that. Uh, we now have an AI Institute for Environmental Sciences, uh, which is led by Dr. Amy McGowan. Um, and I, I, Claire, I think you're also uh, a part of it or, or you know, your team is contributing to it. I know there are a lot of um, uh, you know, people involved in that aspect, um, including Google, Nvidia, Microsoft. So this wasn't there before. Um, I think that is bringing a lot of people together. Uh, and I see that as a positive step. I think that was one thing um, when we had these discussions earlier, like a few years ago, even we were talking about like, how do we bring these people together to start working on these projects? So uh, I'm glad to see the steps in that direction. One challenge I definitely see is uh, that is more or less unique in this area, um, maybe not completely unique, but certainly makes it more challenging is that you can't just have, oh, people in AI and even just another climate scientist and start working together, meeting each other halfway. There's also the policy side of things. And I think you need to kind of put it all together and take that all into account. And that can be uh, overwhelming, I'm sure, um, for people, but it also is an opportunity, I think, to learn a ton at this intersection and it's a crazy intersection. And I think um, something that has really struck me about this community has been kind of the willingness to, to chat and collaborate and talk and um, uh, kind of bolster each other up. Uh, and maybe that is a little bit of function of, you know, there not being commercial interests uh, that are, you know, super tight and all about, you know, oh, I'm going to be private and try to be like better than that other private place. And maybe that helps a little, but I, I do, I do hope that even more people do come into the space. And as Claire suggested, it sounds like it's extremely important to convince people to even work at this intersection um, if you want to lay out a future for them or tell them that there is a future for them. Um, so. Yeah, for me, it's always been like, why do you need monetary motivation? It's it's intrinsic. Like, <laughs> you want the future to be a great future, so it's just there, right? But and then you're like, oh wait, rent. And then you're like, oh, right, oh. yeah, rent. <laughs> um, actually, Nana joined us. Hi, um, I, I was waiting to introduce you. Um, so, Dr. Nana Ama Brown Eklutze is a senior research scientist at the Ghana Space Center and Technology Institute of the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Her research focuses on climate modeling, climate impact assessments. Um, on society such as health, energy, and gender. Welcome. I'm so happy you could join us. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So thank the, you. So the, so far we've covered um, how everyone got involved in the field. So do you want to talk about uh, how you came to work at, at, in this space? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So thanks, and I'm sorry for joining in late. Um, I have a background in physics. And so I was um, interested in knowing what happens in the atmosphere. I was guided to do atmospheric science along the line in my education, and then I got interested in climate modeling. 
in my PhD, I got uh, my first introduction to high performance computing system. I use a lot of data, you know, doing climate, um, working with climate models. And so I eventually got into data science, machine learning and AI. I mean, it was a learning process every day for me as I was doing my uh, PhD. Um, I still use this in my, in my work as I work with the IPCC, uh, my research with AIMS, AIMS Rwanda and AIMS Ghana. But currently I am a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana. So I've moved from the Ghana Space Science and Technology Institute to the University of Ghana. So previously where I worked at the Space uh, Institute, I was also using a lot of data, um, again, doing climate change science and earth observation as well. So a whole lot, and then we're using uh, artificial intelligence in most of the things that we do, um, wanting to understand in modeling terms, uh, um, artificial neural networks, how we, we train um, data to use to predict the future and, and then all that. So I, I would say it was a brief introduction at the very beginning in my, in my, my academic life. And then I, it, it, it shoot up from there. I mean, every day was an interesting thing and new things you're learning and it got interesting by day. And so I'm happy doing this, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And what uh, the other question we were just discussing is, uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced in, in your work um, at the intersection of, of climate modeling and, and computer science? I mean, you have a, a very, uh, you know, a, a very um, specific, you know, viewpoint um, as, uh, you know, you have, you've worked on all these different things, including the IPCC. So what, what are some things that you find that, you know, th some things that we've um, progressed on and other things that are, are still kind of lagging? Yeah. Okay, so in terms of my main research, the only challenging thing is the access to um, high performance computing. As for the algorithms, it's up to you to write them, but to get the platform to run them, it can be challenging. So there are only few institutions in Africa, um, probably one <laughs> in South Africa that um, I'm hooked up to, to work. Otherwise, I have to resort to the I, I, ICTP in, in, in Trieste, Italy, to, to run my simulation there, or otherwise Germany in some institutions to, to, to help me. So that is the main, main challenge. But otherwise, another challenge is between science and policy. So I play this dual role as a scientist, and then I, of course, um, play also at the side of policy because I represent Ghana in the IPCC assembly on behalf of Ghana, so on behalf of my government. So now, as a scientist who works on IPCC, so I have that conflict of interest, which I try as much as possible to, when I have to be a scientist, I must be a scientist. And when I have to talk as a policy person, I must talk as a policy person. It's really challenging, yeah, but, uh, so far, so good. <laughs> I have that different hat that I wear and, and then I talk, so. This is actually a, a question that I wanted to ask all of you. How do you switch from this technical scientific to a more policy making? Like I always find it difficult like to filter almost the way I talk about, you know, science essentially. So how do you make that switch going back and forth? Can I, can I add a little bit more? Of course. So yeah, so in, in, every, in every research that we do, the common question is, how does it benefit the ordinary person on the streets? How does it benefit the ordinary, especially policymakers? How do they understand? You don't understand the jargons that you write in your article. So you can have a paragraph or two about the essence of your work on the society or what a policy make us to do. Obviously, everything we do and the climate change issues, it's about the society, it's about governance. So it would be, well, it, that has been the advocacy. Just a paragraph or two, writing the essence of your results in this, for the society. That helps a lot with the policy decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, uh, talk a little bit about because I think uh, the research that you do, I mean, I think that's similar to what I used to do earlier in my PhD. Um, so I did policy analysis 
for government and the other think tanks. And so it's intertwined, like you are doing scientific work, but then it is this qualitative component to it. So you, you have to talk to stakeholders and politicians, you know, and other people to see how, what kind of solutions they are thinking and what kind of futures that would lead to in this modeling framework. So when we started uh, our you know, energy modeling roadmap, uh, so California had just passed the AB32 uh, law, uh, the Global Warming Act uh, to reduce uh, emissions to, of 1990 levels by 80% of that in 2050. There were all these ideas, uh, but they didn't know how, how that would be achieved in 2050. I mean, that's literally, uh, you know, it's a dark, Forest, like we don't know how that would be acted on. So what we did was like design a policy framework, talk to politicians, uh, talk to other stakeholders uh, and uh, you know customers and things like that, uh, automakers for example, um, and see how they would receive certain policies and how that would be added in the future. You know, like how they would react to certain things. For example, if people are uh, more prone to buying electric cars, like what are the factors that's leading them? I mean, all these are input to the model, but then we have to do a lot of background work to add that in there. So we had to do user surveys uh, and all those like the user research is a big part of it. Um, so do that and add it into it. So I see that as a step-by-step -step fashion, like you go back and forth, um, but I totally understand what you talk about, like switching from technical to policy, like it, it is a different uh, paradigm shift you had to do when you're talking about uh, different things to different people. Yeah, Claire, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's a paradigm shift even for a machine learning researcher to talk with um, with climate scientists. Um, there's a lot of um, words that are defined in a technical discipline that are defined differently in a different scientific discipline. Um, and actually, I, I did avoid opportunities to talk to climate policymakers early on because um, my sort of way of selling climate informatics is that we know AI and machine learning, you know, invented web search, revolutionized bioinformatics. We know that these data-driven methods are just finding patterns in the data. And in order to cut through all the controversy, let's just focus on what the data said. So I actually tried to hide up my environmental activist past and not really um, do any policy or advocacy early in trying to launch this field. But I think it's definitely about time and I'm glad that those conversations are starting. Um, and I also wanted to mention, it's not only policymakers that we want to talk to. So um, we're really interested in sustainability and equity and justice um, here at CU Boulder. Um, and so we're really wanting to talk to stakeholders. We're want wanting to go into communities, give people apps if they have a, a smartphone or some way to monitor um, you know, air pollution due to being um, near a, a project that's bad for the local environment and how those are inequitably placed in society. So, um, Policymakers are a stakeholder, but there are a lot of other stakeholders that need to be taken into account. Of course, Sharon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I've been overall really uh, impressed with, I almost wanna say younger generation of uh, climate activists uh, out there. And I just am so impressed. And so uh, part of me also wants to make sure that the things we're doing can be uh, nicely communicated to them. Uh, be that from memes or just something that they can <laughs> digest easily and that that is in their language and, and all this is about almost like translation right translating to all these different um, type groups of people including those people and something that I've generally taken with me when it comes to both explaining concepts in general in, in science uh, and um, and uh, in specifically at this intersection too is Pretend you're talking to just one person. Pretend you're talking to, actually for me, it's my sister. Um, pretend I'm just talking to her and explaining something to her and seeing what her reactions are. Um, and that's been immensely useful in, uh, in my teaching when it comes to different classes or just explaining concepts. Because I know in, in scientific literature, oftentimes people try to, you know, 
spruce it up a little, add a little bit of math that shouldn't be there. Um, I've, I've heard this awful thing that people write like I squared instead of negative one, <laughs> like what in the world? <laughs> um, so things like that, uh, hopefully uh, we can become a translation barrier and also, also just constantly be exercising that muscle, uh, I think is important. Um, and I would love to see those who are younger uh, get into this space and feel like they're both welcome in this space, but also see exactly what we're doing because we can communicate it to them. True. Uh, I, I find it funny when you say younger generation because I'm like, how how old, how old are they? <laughs> I feel young, but yeah. There are people guess, younger than us? <laughs> there are people younger than me who are doing this. They're like three generations, okay? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't know, actually. No. It's it's true. I keep forgetting that young people have all this power. Yeah, for sure. Um, actually, we have a, a question from the audience that's uh, really interesting and, and um, kind of in sync with, with what you're saying. So um, Nicholas says, I'm still convinced that one of the biggest levers available to influence the climate trajectory with machine learning is by way of contributing to political activism. Have any of you sought to apply machine learning in that context? Um, I can take that uh, a stab at it. Uh, not directly political activism, but I think a part of uh, your awareness with respect to climate change, I think Shasha, you do that too, like, you know, uh, visualizing what's gonna happen in the next 20 to 30 years. I think most of us need to have that concrete image or concrete numbers at least to, to, for that to understand like this is what's gonna be the future of our child, children, you know, uh, that might help. I mean, machine learning might help in there. And in, in another context, I would say that just observing and measuring things, I don't think it's done at that level yet. So for example, emissions over land or ocean, I can talk about that later. Um, the carbon emissions that's coming from certain power plants or oil and gas. Once we start putting that information out there, and it requires a lot of machine learning algorithm to measure, uh, do some kind of data driven analysis to plot it out, find anomalies. I feel like that information should be public. Anybody should be able to go and look at it <clears throat> and understand what's going on in my neighborhood. Like why you to look at carbon dioxide and methane levels. And that, those are things can lead you to activism. I mean, you, you seeing that there's a constant increase of CO2 over the past few years take a plot out of that, send it to your congressmen and senators and ask questions. And I think those things could be a potential trigger to all of this activism. And, and often it's converting data as well. I think that data visualization and presentation is something that, I mean, often gets overlooked, right? Because as, as Sharon says, we're so used to writing I squared, but like, why don't we communi communicate our results in a way that a policymaker can really take it and run with it? Instead of see, saying like, oh, well, you know, the statistically significant p-value, blah, blah, blah. No, say like this, <laughs> because, you know, the headlines will, <laughs> will try to twist it in one way or another. Uh, so like to, to, to communicate is a really important part of it as well, right? Does anyone want to add to the, to the question? Yeah, I wanted to add to the, the, the last bit of um, Kalai's uh, submission. On, on this question, asking uh, how we sought to apply machine learning in, in, in that context of uh, activism. So first, they must understand how machines work. And of course, they must understand what we mean by garbage in, garbage out. So, and then uh, for them to understand how climate models also work. And if we tend to apply artificial intelligence to data, what we, we, we tend to get. So the behavior of the climate in the past, as we just explained to them that look, that is, this is the way the climate has behaved in the past and this is the way it is behaving now. I mean, we can do this simple comparison and then they should trust that for our future projections, especially for these emission uh, scenarios that we always advocate in that we have to pay a particular attention to, to, to them. So policymakers or political activism people, politicians must understand, I mean, based on what we can present in the past and the observations now, they should be able to agree or believe what we are presenting to them in the future. Thanks. And also like, yeah, there is this um, uh, equity issue when in, in related to emissions or even like, for example, toxic emissions, mapping that with demographics 
would be it would give some insight as to how that's not equal everywhere uh, and that's a topic that's not being studied much yet and i think a, a lot of people are doing that now uh, and that is something we need to bring it up with uh, if, uh, the stakeholders think tanks and politicians like yes emissions are increasing and it's not equal everywhere and certain people are getting more affected than others and that is something of great interest too in terms of activism yeah i mean uh, sharon there's some work being done out of stanford right um well stefano actually right uh, with with poverty mapping and um from from satellite imagery but and then there's other work about you know, satellite imagery for emissions mapping but i actually haven't seen the two come together um as far as i'm aware they really should so. they really should right? <laughs> um recently i was actually reviewing a paper that was um detecting like uh, fumes from factories and they can do that pretty pretty accurately now and so I was actually thinking this in my in my head like oh where, where are these factories located can we actually see who's living around them and to try to correlate the data so next CCAI workshop that's <laughs> Sharon oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and like the methane satellites that will be going up soon are very exciting as well because essentially what you're suggesting is attribution we can figure out we can both quantify things and attribute it to certain people or groups, um, like what's ha actually happening versus people's self reports and then like promises, fake, pro yeah. This is like the, the worst field when it comes to keeping promises, I feel like. But um, I think it's also because we're bad at quantifying, right, at a granular level um, as just uh, humanity. So um, that makes it very challenging, I think. Um, a quick note on the political activism side. Um, I think uh, for, a long time I thought it was largely a partisan kind of issue and I think it is seen as that um, but uh, I think there are bits that are definitely bipartisan and I hope that we could leverage that to, to make that happen. I've actually spoken with one of the founders of the Tea Party who is an environmental activist and I'm like that's crazy <laughs> because you're very I don't own a gun and she owns a ton of guns. And so like, yeah, so it's, it's very different um, in some ways, but we're very similar in others. And uh, I wonder if just galvanizing that conversation more and more. And again, I think it's like the generation under us who is actually having those uh, conversations even more. Um, and I see that at, in colleges a lot. And I've been super impressed with the uh, amount of work that they've done and move forward in like basically holding hands with each other and like moving those kind of and I think that's when policies will move forward. Um, but I also think like we definitely need to come at the side of like doing something also radical because then because then people will see um, see what's going on. Um, I totally agree. Hot take. <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> um, we have another question from the audience um, from Pranjal. Um, how far do you think we have come in terms of actually using AI for battling climate change? Are there any current initiatives by companies or governments that are actively using AI for this cause? Claire, do you have a, an idea? Um, sure, yeah. So based on um, you know, who has attended the Climate Informatics Conference um, from government agencies, I know that AI is being used um, in climate and weather predictions um, in Japan, Korea, the UK, Germany, the US. Um, and uh, Kalai mentioned Amy McGovern's new institute. Um, Amy McGovern was known for bringing AI into forecasting tornadoes and hail, which are extremely hard because they're very short, uh, short time ahead in time. So there, there has been some progress. There has been AI work um, from Vipin Kumar's lab that found new teleconnections. So a new dipole that um, climate scientists then needed to look into. Um, and then sometimes the AI work will confirm something that had been figured out um, by climate scientists, but in a completely data-driven way. So M.A. Ebert Uphoff at Colorado State University did um, a Bayesian network approach um, to understand causality um, and notice that over time, storm tracks in the Northern hemisphere are moving northward, um, which sort of you know, confirms meteorological observations. Nana, do you have anything to add uh, from your perspective? You know, you know a lot of what governments are doing, so. Yeah, I mean, definitely that's all Clara has said. Um, it's AI 
It's already being used by a lot of governments, but not mostly African governments, obviously. But South African government is very serious with it. So probably that covers a lot of the African countries. <laughs> So there are individual scientists, of course, in, uh, from Africa who, who are, I mean, seriously getting into, into this field and uh, hooking up to other countries in doing work, even those ones that benefit their own countries, but then they are doing it outside of their country most of the time. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, uh, so I can talk from Park's perspective. Uh, you know, so we do take fundamental research uh, from RPAE and Department of Energy grants to develop. Uh, so I, I'll classify them into two, like macro and micro solutions. So the macro ones are, uh, uh, so we make sensors at Park, for example, um, and we deploy them. So the one of the projects that we got awarded by DARPA is deploying about 5,000 float sensors in the ocean uh, and which is like the, one of the least measured areas uh, compared to terrestrial land. So we want to understand how the salinity changes or pH changes, you know, ocean acidification is a big problem due to carbon sinks and sources. Um, so we are doing, uh, you know, combining the float level data with the satellite level data to understand uh, and develop an algorithm to understand how the carbon emissions change in the ocean at a granular level, like spatial temporal level. Similar things could be done in terrestrial lands, um, like you know, where we can have ground sensors and combine them with satellite. I think Sharon mentioned uh, a few of those things as well. Um, so that's an ongoing project. At the micro level, I think there is a lot of opportunity to understand how human behavior might affect the energy system in general. Say, for example, you're in a building, you have personal comfort devices like an AC or a heater, uh, and how that changes. Now we have sensors everywhere, like Nest has sensors, uh, in, and that connects to the grid. So if you want to optimize the neighborhood as a whole, we want to understand how the human behaviors are driven, uh, whether it's a residential or transportation, so it, we can design policies for them. So I think there's this micro level where you observe from space, and then uh, at the micro level where you observe in the decision making and the humans, uh, and there's everything in between. So I think many startups are around, uh, many companies are coming around, whether in personalized changes for making good uh, decisions or green decisions. And then there, there are these emissions monitoring uh, projects. There are big companies and small companies everywhere in these two areas. Sharon, you kind of have exposure to, to the startup world. Uh, do, you see, do you see some cool things going on there? Yeah, so I think there are definitely startups um, springing up to tackle this space, especially with venture money uh, flooding a bit more into, into this intersection. Um, and I think it largely depends on what you, how you define tackling climate change, like how broadly you're willing to go with that. Like is Tesla technically tackling climate change? And then, uh, and then there's a side of, okay, well also how do you define AI? Are they like using it in their marketing material? <laughs> or I can see a lot of these companies using it eventually for sure, uh, but it's unclear whether they're using it immediately. Um, but I do know uh, Google or Alphabet more at large, uh, is, is working at this intersection and is finding um, competitive uses of it. Uh, so they've definitely released their, their huge weather model recently and, um, sorry, released a paper about it. They did not release the weights, um, I asked. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and they definitely have found nice business cases like in improving data centers, like, right? Like improving efficiency of data centers, which use a ton of energy. And so I think there are definitely areas here. Um, it depends on how broadly you would define uh, a, both AI and both climate, both AI and climate change. And I think that an impediment is still, I mean, kind of always, I guess, but money, right? Because it's not something that will immediately or not necessarily immediately uh, be um, uh, profitable, essentially, right? And so Google, for example, can can put money into that just because they do have a certain, you know, thick skin and they can take some some pressure, but for example, for a startup, I can see how it, it it's hard. Like I've seen startups fail because it's just like, you know, they're not making money. The, the people want, you know, investment, return on investment. So it's definitely hard to, to quantify that benefit. And 
And that's kind of kind of the, the tough part, right? Because you see all this great tech, but on the other hand, it's being applied to oil and gas because, well, there's money there, right? <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> yes. yeah, exactly. So sometimes like I, I see that it's hard, but on the other hand, it's a bit sad. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, I think Claire and Nana, you, you guys will be great for this. Uh, can you share some insights about how AI helps with better climate modeling? Are there mechanisms that can be covered more efficiently or is it about engineering more meaningful data? Sure. Um, so sometimes things that are modeled using a mathematical model, so a partial differential equation, can be emulated using machine learning because you can just take, um, you know, inputs, run it through your dynamical system, and get an output, and that creates what we call labeled training data for supervised learning. Um, and so there's work on emulators. The people I know working on that are. Um, David Gagne at NCAR, David Hall at NVIDIA, Anish Subramanian at my university. Um, and then one thing my group had pushed on in the past was actually, we're not gonna even look under the hood of the climate models. So we're not gonna be climate modelers per se, but any sequence of predictions can be viewed as um, sort of an ensemble and, and any um, ensemble of climate models can be viewed as an ensemble of predictors. And ensemble methods are something that had been highly studied in AI. And that was also sort of my background on online learning from expert advice, particularly when you think that you need to learn a model that is constantly changing. So in the non-stationary setting and in, in climate, we have non-stationarity or time varying data but we also have spatially varying data. So now you have multiple dimensions of non-stationarity and that's one thing my group has looked at. So a climate scientist would call that whole field or approach as data assimilation because you're taking models that are mathematical, they're you know, running differential equations to simulate physical processes. And then you are using observations to compute the prediction skill. In machine learning, we would call that you know, prediction loss or error. In climate, you would call it skill. How well does the physical simulation match the observation? Um, and then trying to do something intelligent with it. Um, so that's, that's a strong way that I see. And then another big way is emulators. Um, and you know, I don't think I, when I first wanted to address a climate modeler, I proposed that um, there are some natural constants in these models that will affect, you know, reaction rates. How fast does one greenhouse gas, you know, break down, et cetera. And I thought that we could do a better job of sort of data mining or machine learning to fit those natural constants. Um, that apparently is not really needed very much. Um, those are viewed as well known as gravity. You know, they're based on scientific first principles, and they've been estimated by uh, past data. But that may need to be revisited. You know, with the non-stationarity um, of climate change. But you can still address it using ensemble techniques because you can take one process. Say, I'm simulating, you know, heat advection from the ocean. I can change that constant, that reaction rate that's that's in the equation. Um, minutely and then run different simulations. Now I have an ensemble of simulations and then that's where AI can come in. Nana, do you have anything to add on that? Um, I mean, you have a climate modeling background as a diploma. That was very, very thorough. <laughs> um, actually, there's one question. I mean, audience questions are great, but uh, there's one question that I really wanted to ask. Um, that I feel comes up a lot in my head um, and I, I wanted to know if I'm the only one. Um, are there common mistakes you see people making when they are endeavoring to fight climate change using machine learning? Um, are there like common things that you see and you kind of just like shake your head at? Um, I, I, have, I have an answer to this question, but I'm curious to see yours. Uh, I can go first. So, <laughs> because one of the things that uh, I felt when a lot of buzz around climate happened is machine learning scientists going and replicating the problem without you know, talking to climate scientists who have been working on it for a very long time. I feel there should be a dialogue before 
taking uh, data and throwing machine learning at it and coming up with solution. I think that's true for any domain. It's not just for climate. Um, I feel that th that dialogue needs to happen. Uh, and climate scientists have been studying this problem for many years. Uh, so they have some knowledge to provide. So I think before, if, if anyone is interested to work on climate and AI, I think they should consider that, that this is an interdisciplinary program. Um, so we need to talk to each other and they cannot do anything on their own and say, hey, I solved climate change using machine learning. That doesn't happen. Uh, so that, that's the only thing I would say. Let me jump in here. You see, there's uh, one thing we do, of course, I would say it's a mistake, but we are aware it is, is the behavior of humans, how we, we of course, it's a challenge for every climate scientist or every machine learning uh, scientist, the behavior of humans, how we're modeling that in our climate change science. It's, it's a very challenging one. Um, so we kind of put a value and we expect that it should, it should run through. But actually human behavior is changing all the time. And how our usage and our impact on climate is it's changing all the time. And from one region to the other is completely different. Our, I don't know, everything is completely different from one human being to the other, from one region to the other, and at different levels. But when you get to machine learning, we have limitations on how we um, put in uh, these effects, you know, like uh, dependent variables in, 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 our, in our research. So, I would say if there is any mistake in that sense, probably this is it, but we are much aware. We just don't have a solution, but slowly, slowly, there are a lot of improvements going forward. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to build upon, Sarah? Um, sorry, this question was about uh, common mistakes. Common mistakes, yeah, exactly. So, um, in the early days, it was sometimes hard to d even talk to climate scientists, depending on who, because um, they had a fear that we were going to come in and replace the physics with models learned from data. Um, and so there was even just some, uh, you know, etiquette in talking to climate scientists. So you had to definitely respect the models and techniques that would use both the physics driven models and the data started to be palatable at first. I mean, that's the first thing um, we worked on, for example. Um, so that's you know one thing for machine learners to be aware of coming in. Um, and then after that, I would just be echoing um, Kali I would say both on the domain scientist side, please don't just grab a package off of GitHub and apply it with the default parameter settings. Please have at least one student in your lab take a machine learning class, or ideally, if you can find a machine learner in your um, area to collaborate, um, because it's it's echoing what Dr. Klutza said, garbage in, garbage out. You, you know, there can be bias that is introduced by your data um, and bias introduced by um, hyperparameter settings that you don't um, tune properly. And by tune, I do not mean try to optimize for the data that you're going to ultimately um, publish your results on. It has to be a held out separate validation set. And I think that word tune is often pretty confusing uh, to, to people that um, are going to uh, apply machine learning. So I apologize for that, but that's the word that we use in the community of AI. Um, and then by the same token, just echoing what Kalai said, you're an AI person, you've gotten fired up. That is awesome. Welcome to this community. Um, but please, please, please find a domain expert. If you're a student, you know, go across campus to a student working on some interesting um, climate change related problem. Um, but those personal connections are key. You know, go on a hike together if you're in a beautiful place drink beer together. These are some of the techniques we have found that have helped, but every collaboration really starts with a relationship across the disciplines for sure. From the beginning, I think that's also some, something important that people sometimes like 
start and, and start working and then follow up with domain experts by the time they already have like an initial model or even an approach, right? But it's like, no, before you even start working, talk to someone from the field, please. <laughs> I think one, um, so I completely agree with that and you can't work in a silo. Though I think one thing that might be a little bit easier for folks is you can like start on a data set or something, but and you can start on your own. It's just that you have to know that you are doing this so that you can then show it to someone who is on the other side, right? To say that, hey, I'm actually serious about this. I mean, I think that's valid. Just know that that's definitely not going to be your end game. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, I've definitely seen just like Claire, uh, lack of test sets, like actual held out test sets in the field. And that does worry me a lot. Um, because then that means like all the results are probably not right. Uh, and then, uh, but at, at the same time, like, yes, find these collaborations, but also know that they're not always gonna fill in every single gap too. And I think um, someone mentioned, I think maybe Claire Bias and uh, uh, machine learning people, we don't think enough about bias. I know we talk about it, but we don't think about it enough or rather we don't integrate it into our typical workflow enough. It's not like, it, it, I don't put it into my pipeline immediately. Like I don't, why don't I do that? I should do that. And so like also as you uh, kind of meet each other halfway, think about, you know, think about what gaps are not being filled by either of you. Right, and I think that uh, thinking about um, together about how applications can be done as well, because I mean, if you're working for example on an applied problem, thinking about how someone can use this and not just, you know, I don't know, counting something on some satellite imagery just because you can do it and it seems like a cool problem, right? But think about how people can actually use this and try to formulate the problem in a way that it's usable for the, for the end, end, end game, I guess. Um, so I prepared some questions for each of you because um, there, there's really specific aspects that I'm really curious about. So I hope you don't mind. Um, for example, Claire, um, you are a pioneer of this field. You've been around. I mean, your NeurIPS tutorial is actually the reason I got into this field. I didn't get to, ch to, to share my journey, but that was the trigger moment for me. Um, so can you talk about like how the space has evolved since you, you started working? And do you feel, you know, how, what's changed and, and what can, can still be improved or, you know, just generally speaking? Well, thanks for your kind words. Um, so it, at first I was actually doing some metrics on this. I haven't done it recently, but it did seem like there was really an uptick in mentions of machine learning, deep learning and climate informatics at AGU or other um, geoscience and climate science venues. Um, and then also every time I reviewed for an AI conference, I would lobby them to add a keyword for climate or climate and sustainability. And we've seen now an uptick in publications um, on climate related topics at machine learning venues. So that's one metric. Um, we've seen things like the University of Toronto launched a professorship on sustainability and climate informatics. Um, we already mentioned the, the companies adding uh, groups for that. Um, and um, some of these investments are going to be, you know, very large by companies. So that's really exciting. And actually, I think companies and philanthropies really stepped up after the 2017 inauguration in the US. Um, because if you have an executive branch that denies uh, climate change or denies the science, then suddenly everyone was worried about the threats to government funding. Um, luckily, I don't think government funding was affected too much in say DOE and military concerns who have cared about climate change for a long time. But you know that EPA was essentially gutted and there were some threats, but luckily, um, or not luckily, thank you to the companies and philanthropies for um, stepping up. Um, I was um, gonna just mention a few other milestones. So in 2018, the World Economic Forum um, actually put out a report called AI for Earth. Um, and so, you know, that's great. That's a, a call to action um, from sort of a mainstream, um, a mainstream organization and, um, you know, climate informatics was in there. So that was great. Um, we're now launching a journal. Actually, um, I'll, I'll make a soft announcement. Cambridge University Press is launching a journal on environmental data science. Um, and also we're, 
announcing uh, Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics seven week program, like residence program, if people wanna to come to Santa Barbara, uh, hopefully by next November, that'll be possible um, on ML for climate. So I think we're going in the right direction. I think um, I like the, the way that your, your uh, CCAI group is channeling the, the younger generation um, into this. I think a lot of people are very excited now. Um, so I think we're going in the right direction um, and I partly credit the election, ironically. Thank you. Um, Nana, I had a question for you. Um, I mean, you're the most involved in, in, in governance on, a, on an international level um, with the IPCC, uh, et cetera. So how is the work that we're doing uh, in, you know, broadly speaking, computing and climate change perceived there? Is it like on the radar? Are people like aware of this? Um, are, are they ready to integrate it? Is it like, is it at all plausible for them? No, a, a lot of people are not aware of the work I do with the IPCC or the United Nations. And even people in government at the ministry, ministerial level are not even aware what's going on. But of course, every, everyone kind of have an idea that there's climate change, but the details of it, most people do not know. The impact, of course, uh, are seen. And it's easy to point out that this is the impact of climate change. And uh, where there is the mitigation aspect, it's a little bit of a challenge because um, especially a few people who are aware of what climate change is, will tell you that um, especially in Africa or Ghana specifically, we not uh, adding much of the emissions. So why talk about mitigations if we are not even, I mean, adding that. In actual fact, in Ghana, we have carbon credits. So um, to pursue people, to be climate conscious and all that, it's, it's a little bit dicey, you know. But of course, we try to let them understand that every, every little change or every little contribution can be a big thing when it comes to climate change. So I normally will use a, a cup full of water to the brim as an example that it takes just a drop for it to overflow and it doesn't overflow with just that one drop but it overflows with a lot more of the water down so that small thing you may do in ghana can cause a big change in in, in the climate so as much as possible in the in our outreach activities we try to explain some of these things to everyone but they education is not down with the people that much. But of course, the evidence of climate change is seen, but what to do or how to go about life is still the same, no change. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's really unfortunate. But I think, I think it, it's become, I have hope that it's becoming more mainstream. It, it's becoming a bit more, um, people are becoming more aware of it. So I guess that's the first step to, to taking action. Um, Kalai, um, you mentioned quite briefly uh, emissions monitoring projects. Um, so what, can you give us a bit more details about that? Like how, what kind of technologies are being deployed and like what the scope of the project is? Yeah, so before that, I would echo with Claire uh, that even uh, with PARC and its owned by Xerox. So uh, three years ago, we never had any initiative for climate change, but now Xerox has a clean tech initiative uh, that uh, goes with, you know, that deploys a lot of climate related projects, mainly to reduce emissions. So uh, that's a good segue to this because, you know, uh, PARC does a lot of fundamental research uh, in AI, it's sensor development uh, and deployment. So we got awarded uh, a DARPA grant to develop uh, ocean float sensors. Um, so uh, there were two phases, so PARC won both phases, and we are currently in the process of deploying um, about hundreds of thousands of them uh, in the Gulf of Mexico to measure sea surface temperature, uh, salinity, chlorophyll content. Uh, uh, um, it's, it measures a variety of things. So this is mainly to understand, you know, for example, um, there are carbon sources and sinks in the ocean that's not mapped more accurately at a granular level. And the biological production changes rapidly in the ocean. Um, and why do we need to quantify it? Because uh, only if we know how much the ocean is taking carbon in, 
we can quantify the global carbon cycle accurately. Um, so measuring these things in combination with the satellite data, which can measure the vastness of the ocean, um, and it can include, incorporate with the high temporal uh, data that's coming from the floats, we can get the granularity needed to understand the acidification patterns and carbon patterns. Uh, so that's one part of it. And, uh, and, and Park also does the other things that I mentioned. And uh, Nana, you mentioned about human behavior. So that's a big part of what Park works on is human aware AI systems. Uh, so that has been the concentration, like uh, uh, some of my amazing colleagues have been working on it to introduce agent-based models, to do human behavior analysis and include it in there. Uh, and even for emissions, like for industries that are working in it, like aquaculture or any of those things, they need to understand how the acidification happens so they can move their, uh, pro, you know, what's it called, the lobster farms or anywhere to, for quality control. Um, so all of that is an interplay, a complex interplay between environment and human behavior. Thank you. It does seem like a, a very a big part of the puzzle with, with different yeah. edges. It's, it's, it's really great. Um, and Sharon, my, my question for you, you, you mentioned uh, your work in, in healthcare and social good. So how do you see these fields uh, with regards to like, climate change? And, and do, you, do you feel like it's harder in climate or, or you know, are there, are, are there more hurdles than in healthcare or, or vice versa? I definitely draw parallels between the two because um, both are highly regulated and matter a lot at uh, national levels across all the nations um, and differ um, uh, across uh, and nationally, they differ. Um, uh, and so I think, um, I've definitely uh, seen how uh, also how uncertainty quantifications or different techniques apply to both and are, are and they matter a lot to both. So uncertainty matters a ton to climate, also matters a ton in healthcare. Imagine if you weren't, if the model produced, said something like, oh, you have cancer, but it was uncertain, you kind of want to know how certain it was. Um, and same with climate, of course, those uncertainty bounds are extremely, extremely important. And I think the data also uh, is, there are large amounts of data. Some of it is very siloed um, and uh, the modalities are just very disparate. Uh, so we have satellite imagery, so we have nice imagery, but we also have a ton of, um, a ton of different, uh, you know, tabular data that we have stored in various places. And we also have this kind of modeling we need to do on human behavior, which is suggested by several other people here, uh, which do matter and policy decisions matter will change the uh, data distribution that we're working with. And so I think that is all very common here. And I think it's not things that people actually eye that much in core machine learning work. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for both these fields uh, to actually bring to light, you know, this is a really important problem that does generalize, by the way, since you like generalization, does generalize across multiple fields um, and will make a concrete impact uh, on them. So I think uh, I've definitely, you know, learned about or seen more problems by working, working at these intersections. Yeah, it's true. They both have pretty unique uh, like problems in terms of interpretability, generalizability. So it's really, uh, I think, I think also like on, uh, both have this legislation aspect of to them, right? You have to really take into account what people, how, how the health system or how the, the climate system is, is made in that country, like where are the decisions being made and things like that. Um, so I had a, a last question that I kind of wanted to um, end on a, on a positive note. Um, I know that, I mean, Probably all of you have people reaching out to you quite regularly and uh, often, you know, get inspired by your work, rightly so. Um, and so when people say, like, how do I get involved? Um, you know, how do I use my skills to tackle climate change? What's like your go to uh, project or application or idea that you that you, you know, propose to people when they reach out to you with, with these kinds of uh, requests? Nana, do you have a, a specific technique that you that you like uh, proposing, or like when you have a new student come in, how do you help them choose like what they're working on? Okay, so I, I normally the uh, some of the challenges that as we discuss here, uh, what I normally would suggest to students to, to start. I mean, this is research. You don't need to come to. 
uh, a meaningful conclusion necessarily. So for example, I've been thinking of, I mean, cloud, cloud behavior is not my main research, but it's something I wish to do. I don't have funding for, but then I have a student whom I discussed this with and is very happy and enthusiastic to, to, to learn or study uh, the cloud behavior. So I'm a very a happy- project at Mila about this. You should, oh, you should that's good. connect, yeah, we actually, we have- uh -huh. Yeah. So, so we plan to, to, to try uh, stochastic modeling uh, to see how we can understand this cloud behavior. At a point, we are kind of relating cloud behavior to human behavior, you know? So it's still a big challenge in climate modeling, um, especially when you're running uh, regional climate models um, at, a, at a small scale uh, level. The cloud systems are really very complicated. So that's one thing we are doing. And then the other, the other thing I'm working on with my student is also, I mean, intelligently predicting uh, floods and especially flash floods, uh, which is also a big challenge in Africa. Uh, we know flat floods are normally because, not because of uh, too much rainfall, but because of our uh development architecture in most of the cities so that's uh, another thing we're trying to understand so i would say normally the gaps that i i feel i have not worked on or wish need to i need more hands on i do that with my my student as much as possible and of course when i get collaboration or collaborators i also propose and then we work along um, these, some of these things those are really important challenges. Sure. Uh, Kalai? Yeah. Um, so, so firstly, I would uh, do a PSA saying like uh, we might hire a few people, postdocs uh, and interns next year. So if anyone is interested in emissions monitoring on land or ocean or building related analysis, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, so we're excited to work on these projects. Now that's the official part. Uh, so personally, I would say, uh, if you're interested in a climate related project, just think it personally, how you can, uh, you know, based on how you use the, the infrastructure and other things, how can you develop a data science project? For instance, I drive a hydrogen car. Uh, so when I got it two years ago, uh, there are uh, about like 20 stations uh, in California that can fuel hydrogen. Um, I was fueling at different stations and some of them sucked and some of them worked very well. So I collected a bunch of data for three months, did a data science project, uh, like did a survey, published two papers out of it, all personal projects. Uh, and it is rewarding to work on something like this because you're contributing, and these are all low hanging problems because the machine learning researchers or AI scientists are not running after it. So you will be one of the pioneers if you work on such things. So just go after a, a personal problem that you're finding a hard time with, or you think you know it could be done better. I think that would I would suggest that to students uh, who are looking into something unique and interesting to work with. But uh, reach out to me if you are interested in applying <laughs> to Park, and definitely would be willing to talk to you. Yeah, and I think that you you raise a really important point of of following your um, affinity and what you're really interested in, like to hydrogen cars, you know, so for some people it could be clouds, for other people it could be human behavior, right? To kind of take that nucleus of interest and kind of roll with it because that's how, that's how great research happens, right? With passion. So I think that passion is a huge part of the equation. Um, Claire, Sharon, do you have any, any thoughts about this? Yeah, I agree um, with that about um, really putting the question back on the student about what they're passionate on. Um, you know, I had a student who had been publishing with me in climate informatics, but then got really interested more in humanitarian aid and poverty mapping. And, you know, the student is um, supposed to become the researcher, so they should certainly be uh, driving the path. Um, and I really am supporting her and trying to find out how to work on that. Um, personally, at the beginning of the call, before we went live, I was uh, telling the panelists that there's smoke outside from wildfire. And so we're starting to look at the complex interaction between water management, um, energy systems, um, and air quality. So sometimes you'll detect from space 
air quality issues that you might be looking for fossil fuel um, enforcement uh, issues of, of finding these, these um, emissions, but actually you're getting fooled by fire, forest fires. Um, so we're, we're sort of at that intersection and then also bringing in environmental justice. And so for example, uh, if, if people are particularly affected by the wildfires or, or want to get involved, what's an example of, of something that they can do? Is it, can they like go out and measure air quality or what are some, some projects there? Um, I would, so, I mean, there's issues around prediction of risk, forecasting, um, risk of wildfire. Um, there's a lot of interesting data integration aspects because sometimes flights will go out, but they'll only be able to measure on certain trajectories um, and at different time scales than other, um, other data sets that we might have. Um, and then, uh, you know, you might be at a place that has proprietary data at much higher time scales. I think I would, if you're a student, I would look at uh, the university for people in all different related departments that might be working on wildfire. There's actually really a lot going on. I was actually recently reading about this in, in Wired and they were saying that with regards to wildfire, there's so much we don't know how it propagates, different scales, right? Uh, different, different regions, different types of forests. And so they were actually like advocating for people to get involved in this because of the, and especially with the changing climate, the models themselves are not necessarily applicable, right? Like you can't just copy paste the models that from the sixties or seventies that were mostly um, hand engineered. So, so for me, when I was reading this, I was like, why are not more machine learning people working on wildfires? But I'm sure there are, there are quite a bit. I just don't know, I don't know that many. Um, Sharon, how about you? What do you throw at people when they come to you asking for cool projects to work on? Well, first, yes, wildfires and clouds, we don't know like anything about, <laughs> which I think has been touched on by everyone here. Uh, and it's crazy that we don't. Um, and uh, so I, I like to, the way I approach like a new student getting into the space is I kind of want to find a, a little sparkle in their eye. And so I think two modes of people come to me and one, one mode is definitely like hey, I like see this problem. I've cared about, you know, climate activism, blah, blah, blah. Like I want to solve this problem. And then I'm like, let's do it. And let's think about, you know, what are some AI techniques? Like how, how can we be helpful at all? Um, and if we can't be helpful, what else can we do? Like it, w without AI, it's okay. You don't have to solve everything with AI. Um, and then the other mode I would say is someone who's like, hey, I, I can see this as a huge problem. Uh, and I, I know a lot of AI, I have a skill in, especially in, I don't know, computer vision, generative models, unsupervised learning, representation learning, I don't know, something, um, but doesn't know generally, you know, doesn't, is a little bit agnostic to the exact project. And for that, I'd be like, okay, well, the fine, what technique do you really like um, and let's see if there are uses for it that would be useful. And of course, like, there's like, okay, which one do you, which one makes your eyes sparkle, the hammer, the nail here. But I think the goal is really just to get, it's momentum is to get someone in just a little bit and then give them a little bit of momentum going. And then as you work on things, my God, do you learn things? <laughs> like the beginning, don't know anything. And then as you keep learning, you really, you really have to work with the problem to learn more. And, I, and so I think just that foot in the door, that initial um, little push uh, is, is it helps if they really want to do one, one, one of those things. And just in the last minute, um, um, someone asked about resources. So can you add, can you add like one resource that you would recommend for people just starting out um, super quickly? They could read our paper, Sasha. No <laughs> Sex and climate awesome. which changes machine awesome. learning. <laughs> Um, no, no, sorry. That is not the only resource. Uh, there is CCAI um, uh, as an organization, uh, uh, climatechange.ai. Um, and there are, I guess it depends on what angle you want to take when it comes to these resources, but there are a bunch of papers that do come out of these workshops. Um, so uh, Claire's 2014 NeurIPS tutorial. Oh, yes. Exactly. That's right. There. <laughs> Thanks. It's on my website. There you go. Kalai, do you have a go-to resource that you recommend to people? Uh, I started with Claire's tutorial. I would right. say that as well. Yeah, that, that's like the holy grail <laughs> to start with. So I would, I would definitely recommend that. Yeah, Nana, do you have any other thoughts?
Okay, so I, I, I start with giving a general overview of the opportunities in climate science research and the excitement there are uh, in, in the research, but I always refer to the IPCC <laughs> uh, documentation as well. I mean, I think it's the most credible uh, information, of course, and then publications as others have already uh, talked about. But of course, there are a host of materials online that people can always um, get onto and read and stuff like that. But I don't forget the critics as well. So <laughs> I let them know that there are, there are climate crit critics. So, I mean, sometimes it's interesting to read what they think about um, the, the other side. So um, you must know what others are thinking as well about what you're excitedly doing. <laughs> yeah, so basically, yes, that's it. All right, thank you. Um, I think we're just at time. So um, Mia, are you gonna give an outro? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, sending it over to me. Um, thank you everyone for joining. This was a fantastic panel and thank you Sasha for fantastic moderating. Um, and we're so happy to have such a great panel with all these wonderful women. So thank you for joining us, uh, Nana, Ama, Claire, Kalai and Sharon. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending and for your questions. The video will be available on the session page where you joined the session and also on our YouTube channel. So if you want to refer back to anything for all those resources, go ahead and check that out. Um, one quick note, there's a session coming up on Monday centered on machine learning for sustainable agriculture. So if you enjoyed this session, there might be some overlap there. That's going to be Monday the 26th at 10.30 a.m. PT. So be sure to check that out. Um, and that's all I got. So thanks so much, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.